Throughout the 1920s, the U.S. economy looked like it was doing really well. The country had turned to welfare capitalism or letting business run the country. And it was believed that if business was allowed to run the country, that is best for the welfare of everyone. What is the test of this? How well is the country doing and how well are individuals doing? Throughout most of the 1920s, the answer was things are going well. And the party that was associated with this was the Republican Party. They dominated through the 1920s overwhelmingly because they promoted uh, welfare capitalism and they were the party that was associated with the prosperity of the 1920s. Uh, they took credit for the good economy and the individual that was most associated with the good economy was Herbert Hoover, the Secretary of Commerce under Harding and Coolidge. So when the Republicans held their convention in Kansas City, Missouri in 1928, he was overwhelmingly supported. He won on the first ballot and he said, we in America today are near the final triumph over poverty than ever before in the history of any land. Very prophetic words. So, the architect for the prosperity is now the nominee. What chance do the Democrats have? Absolutely none. Most importantly, they are running against prosperity. And again, the economy looked like it was doing fantastic. But as I've mentioned before, Democrats, they tend to be just awful at politics. And so they had no chance in hell of winning anyway. And then they nominated this guy right here, Al Smith. Smith was the governor of New York. And again, just they could not have picked a worse candidate. Uh, he was, so he was associated with Tammany Hall, that's uh, considered very corrupt, New York, uh, New York City. Uh, and again, he's running for the Democrats. Remember, the D Democrats are an insane party anyway, because it's the solid South, but also big cities. And immigrants, he is the son of immigrants. He was against prohibition, which Southern Democrats were entirely for. He was against the KKK, and he was against lynching. So Democrats nominated a candidate that was completely opposed to what Democrats in the Solid South were for. And don't want to upset anyone, but he was a Catholic, the first Catholic to ever be nominated. Now, obviously, now that it's not a big deal, but back then it was a huge deal. Back then it was really upsetting, uh, especially for people in Texas. This was the first time Texas will voluntarily go Republican. They did during Reconstruction, uh, but it's the first time Texas ever goes Republican because the idea of nominating a Catholic was just too much for most Southerners. So. Hoover wins overwhelmingly. And when Hoover became president, the economy looked great, and Hoover, again, was considered the architect of the great economy. Four years later, he will leave office the object of ridicule and scorn. Uh, his name will become synonymous with collapse. Hoovervilles were like shanty towns or where people set up uh, homeless encampments. A Hoover blanket was a newspaper homeless people would use to cover themselves to stay warm. In Texas, a Hoover hog was uh, roadkill, especially armadillos. That's what people would eat. So the great prosperity of the 1920s will collapse into the worst financial catastrophe in human history, the Great Depression. Now, it is not 
it's not fair or accurate to say Hoover was responsible or even the, the Republicans were responsible for the collapse. Uh, some of their policies exacerbate it, but it is not accurate to say they are responsible for it. But they had tied their, and they had tied themselves so closely to the economy and they had gotten the political benefits of being tied to the economy, which is why they won overwhelmingly throughout the 1920s. So it is fair that when the economy collapsed, the Republican Party would go down with it because they had tied themselves so closely to the economy that it was impossible for them to untie themselves to it when the economy collapsed. So what exactly caused the Great Depression? Now, I am going to, for this is a survey level class, so I will give you the very simplest explanation I possibly can by looking at, we will look at four things. Uh, first, basic overview of the economy. economy. And when I say basic, I mean very, very basic. Uh, second, the underlying weaknesses of the economy in the 1920s. It looked nice, but there were some problems. Third, the stock market, what the stock market is, how it works. Fourth, the crash. And fifth, how the crash touched off, didn't cause, it touched off the Great Depression. So this is, again, a very oversimplified version because it, actual causes are very, very complex. We're not even going to get into monetary policy. Uh, so we will look at the... We will look at this in a very broad, uh, broad sense, but it is so important to understand the anatomy of what an economic collapse looks like. First and foremost, the very basics of how a capitalist system works. And apologies to all economists, but this is a very basic basic understanding of how capitalism works. In a capitalist system, you will have investments, investors, and consumers. There's investment spending, that is people that build factories, people that hire workers, and then there are consumers, the rest of us, that buy the goods investors produce. So investors, they hire workers, they hire, build factories, and then they produce goods. The consumers buy those goods, with the money from being hired by the investors, and so they put the money back into the investment. Now, this is not a 50-50 split, and this is so important to know, you must know this. In the United States, this isn't true in all countries, but in the United States, cons consumer spending makes up 70% of the US economy. So this spiral is not 50-50, consumer spending makes up 70% of this cycle. When the cycle is going well, there are a lot of consumers that can buy a lot of goods. But when this gets too out of uh, imbalance, then the whole system starts getting shaky. And during the 1920s, this system worked well until we got to about 1927. And then the system started really becoming disjointed. What led to the whole system becoming disjointed? There were three big things. There were three big things that led to a, this cycle becoming skewed. First and foremost, the over-concentration of wealth. Now, there will always be a concentration of wealth. There will always be really wealthy people but when you have a situation where there is too much money in the hands of too few people, then you have an over-concentration of wealth. And uh, do not say, don't say something ridiculous like I am saying that we need to redistribute wealth. I am not giving any cure for this. I'm just 
pointing out that when there's an overconcentration of wealth, it is always a sign of a sick economy. And it is not a coincidence that income inequality in the United States, it's measured by something called the Gini Index. You don't have to know that, but uh, economic inequality in the United States in 1929, when the collapse happened, was the same as it was in 2007, right before that economic collapse. So when there's an overconcentration of wealth, that means it is a sick economy. Uh, just so you know, the concentration of wealth now is significantly worse than it was in 2007 and 1929. Uh, it is really bad now. So that's one of the causes. When you have too much money in the hands of too, too, uh, too small of a group of individuals, you don't have a big enough consumer class. Second big problem was debt. So during the 1920s, we had gotten into installment buying and you know, Americans, all of a sudden you could get these goods without having all the money. And so debt spending went up dramatically, more than doubled throughout the 1920s. Debt spending by 1927-28 was $3 billion, which now doesn't seem like a whole lot, but about half of all cars were bought in installment payments and uh, more than 80% of, of home appliances were, on, were bought with debt. So that is a lot of debt. That means Obviously, people had over-consumed. Uh, right now, this year in 2024, consumer debt spending reached $1 trillion for the first time in history. Uh, so we are currently also at a high point or a low point, depending on how you want to phrase it, in debt spending in U.S. history. So that was obviously, that greatly decreases uh, Americans' ability to consume. And third, farmers. Farmers have been doing bad since the Gilded Age. The only period when farmers stopped doing bad from the Gilded Age up until we get to the 1930s is World War I, when Europe was buying so much, so much uh, farm goods from the United States. But during the 1920s, they started doing really bad again. So depression in agriculture was a huge problem because farmers still made up a, a decent amount of the U.S. Pop, uh, population. So farmers were also doing bad. So you had just a huge part of the economy, huge part of the consumers in the United States that stop being able to consume by 1927. So that investment consumer cycle, that had reached its plateau. By 1927, consumer spending had declined to the point that investment spending also started to decline. Businesses, they started stock, or they couldn't sell their goods. So cars stopped selling, radios stopped selling, tractors stopped selling, appliances stopped selling. So when those goods weren't selling, they were starting to pile up in warehouses and the company stopped producing as many. So when they stopped producing as many, of course, they are going to start to cutting back on employment, cutting back on the number of employees, cutting back on employees' pay, which obviously means those people can no longer consume. So by 1927, the whole system was it was obvious there, there was a problem. So in the 1920s, overall, the economy looked good, but it was basically a bunch of dynamite. The U.S. economy was sitting on a bunch of dynamite waiting for a spark, and that spark would come from the stock market. So we had a shaky economy, and the thing that will light it off was the stock market. Now, there's a couple of things you must know about the stock market. If you know nothing else about the stock market, you need to know, at the very least, you need to know these three things. First and foremost, 
The stock market is not the economy. Way too many people point to the stock market and say, look how good the economy is doing. The stock market is not the economy. They are, I cannot stress that enough. Stock market is not the economy. It's not the economy. It is not the economy. It is an indicator in the economy, but it is not the economy. Second thing to know, stock prices do not necessarily have anything to do with how a company is doing. So if a company is doing well, stock prices will go up, generally speaking. But it doesn't have to. It is very, quite often, stock prices will go up even if a company is not doing well. And that is what you call speculation. People are not buying the stock because they think the company is going to do well. They're buying the stock because they think the stock price itself will go up and then they can sell the stock for more money. So stock prices do not necessarily have anything to do with the company itself. If you buy a stock with the intention of selling it when it goes higher, when the price goes higher, uh, without even considering the company, that is speculation. That is called a capital gain. So that is really important to know. We saw this very recently with GameStop. GameStop, terrible business model in the age of the internet when you just download games from your, the comfort of your home. But stock prices for GameStop soared, and it's just because this ridiculous set of circumstances where a bunch of kids were sitting at home with their new phones, where you had Robin Hood, where they could play the stock market like it was a video game, and they got their stimmies or stimulus checks from COVID, and so they were able to pump money into it. But the company itself was not doing well. That is an example of stocks prices going up without any regard to the company itself. Third thing to understand about the stock market is it is one of the very few things in life that is self-actualizing. You know, uh, when, I, when I say self-actualizing, I mean, if enough people think the stock market is going to go up, then what happens? They invest, they put their money into it, and then when they put their money into it, stock prices go up. So it's one of the very few things that like, uh, it's called the Tinkerbell effect. If you remember Peter Pan, how do you fly? Well, you just have to believe in fairy dust. Well, if you just believe the stock market's gonna go up, then it will go up. So uh, it can go up without any regard. Uh, stock market can go up without any regard to how the economy is doing and how companies are doing. My favorite definition of the stock market it's a consensual mass delusion based on the fictitious valuing of abstract assets. Uh, put another way, it's just, it's just gambling quite often. We arbitrarily put numbers of what a company is worth and it's, we're basically all agreeing to this delusion. So those are the three things to generally know about the stock market. Now, Another thing to understand is that there are two animals on the stock market, the bull and the bear. When the stock market is going down, it is a bear market. When the stock market is going up, it is a bull market. Throughout the 1920s, the country had a bull market. Stock prices were going up and uh, they were going up because businesses were doing well. But then beginning in 1927, stock prices just went up like crazy. When I say went up like crazy, I mean without any consideration to the companies at all. Stock values just absolutely boomed and it made no sense whatsoever. Because if you remember in 1927, that's when businesses stopped producing as much. So at the same time they're not producing as much, all of a sudden stocks are just going absolutely crazy. Uh, I don't have to know this, but I'll give you an example. RCA, Radio Corporation of America, in uh, 1928, stocks 
were selling for like $85. Labor Day, 19, uh, 1928, stocks were selling for $85 a share. By 1929, one year later, they were selling for $505 a share. They had gone from $85 to $505 in one year, and the company was not paying out dividends. The company was not earning money. People weren't buying radios. So that means people are buying and selling those stocks just because they think the price is going to go up. This is what you call a bubble. Not all, but most economic collapses in U.S. history have a bubble involved. During the 1800s, it was usually land speculation. Uh, during the 20th century, it was usually, it's usually related to stocks. Uh, bubbles, just so you know, when a bubble is created, there is not situations there. When the bubble is created really fast, it doesn't just gradually shrink down, it pops. Currently, we are living through two, we have two bubbles going on. We have a stock market bubble, and especially tech stocks, and we have a housing bubble. Since COVID, the price of houses has gone up in ways that do not, uh, they're overvalued, and they're incredibly overvalued. So, what caused this? How is, why did the stock market boom when business conditions were we're not doing well. What led to the wild bull market? Two main things. First, the over-concentration of wealth. So when consumers stop spend, when consumers stop buying, you still have these really wealthy people with a lot of money. What are they going to do with their money? Are they going to build more factories and hire more workers when no one is buying? Obviously not. They're going to put it in a savings account that has doesn't you don't get much back from the savings account, of course not. So they put it in the stock market. Over concentration of wealth, it will almost always lead to the people with a lot of money putting their money into the stock market, making your money work for you. So you had a lot of very wealthy people that put a lot of uh, all their money into the stock market, which led to this massive, massive spike. Second, and this is really important to understand, a large, a relatively large part of the U.S. population actually got into the stock, stock market and speculation. I say relatively large because I think it was like 14 to 16 percent. may not seem like a lot, but for the time that was a lot of uh, people in the stock market. How were so many average Americans able, able to get into the stock market? And this is really important to know. It's called buying on margin. It means buying stocks on credit or with a loan. So an average individual, I, you want to buy a stock, you go to your stock broker and say, I want to buy this stock, I think it's going to go up. You were able to buy a hundred dollars or buy a stock with 10 to 15 percent down. So if it's a hundred dollar stock, you go to your stock broker and say, here is ten dollars. And then it is loaning you, you are being loaned the other $90. Now, what is, if you buy a house, you buy a car, you buy it with a loan, you buy on credit, you have to have a collateral. Collateral is usually uh, the house or the car. Collateral is when you can't pay it back, what happens? You have to give the house or the car back. So what is the collateral for the stock's bottom margin? The stock itself. Think about that. So you are buying a stock for a, that costs $100. You are paying 10% down. And 90% of that, you are getting a loan for. Where is that loan coming from? Banks. Average banks throughout the country. Not all of them, but banks were getting into this, especially bigger banks, were getting into lending out individuals' life savings so other people could play the stock market. By 1929, there was more than $10 billion wrapped up on stocks bought on margin. So banks are lending out people's life savings so other people can play the stock market. 
And that is really important to understand. Now, if after 1927, the only thing that's making the stock market go up was faith, that's the only thing that's keeping its value, what is it going to take for it to go down? A loss of faith. A simple loss of faith. Simple realization that the emperor has no clothes is going to bring it down. All bubbles pop. And when the bubble, is, when the bubble grow, grows too big too fast, it pops. And by 1929, there were some very big spenders. There were some very, very big investors that realized, oh, this is a bubble. And once those individuals realized there's a bubble, they started doing what's called selling short. If you've ever seen the movie, The Big Short, that is about the 2007, 2008 crash. Uh, selling short is when you think the stock market is gonna go down, you sell short. You're basically selling stocks you don't own. So. Like, for example, you think the stock market is going to collapse on, um, we'll say, RCA, the example we used before. So you sell stocks today, and it was worth like $505 in 1829. So you sell it to 100 stocks, and you get the money for those stocks with the promise that you're going to pay it back at a future date, like a year from then. So the idea with selling short is you sell now so you get all the money, and then a year from now, you... Uh, have to pay it back. So what you're hoping is the stock collapses and it's only worth like $50. So then a year from now, you have only have to pay back uh, that amount of money. Instead of you sold it for 505 and then a year later, you only have to sell it for 50. Selling short is an indicator that people think the stock market is about to go down and it is about to collapse. As we mentioned before, the stock market is a self-fulfilling prophecy. So, as the story goes, and there's no, uh, it's po probably apocryphal, probably not true, but as the story goes, it started with the shoe shine boy. Shoe shine boy shining some guy's shoes, and he said, hey, did you hear about J.P. Morgan? He sold, sold some stock short. Guy getting his shoe shine is like, what? J.P. Morgan? And he said, yeah, he sold some, sold, uh, selling short on some stock market. So, what does that guy do? Well, J.P. Morgan's doing it. He must know something. He goes and starts selling. And then someone's like, oh, that guy's selling? I'm going to sell. And it led to a complete collapse. It's called Black Tuesday. October uh, 1929, there was a mass, mass sell-off. And once there was that one mass sell-off, it just went down, 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 down. Over the course of the next four years after 1929, the stock market will lose $40 billion in its value. Now, how exactly, if the stock market is not the economy, how did the stock market collapse help spark the Great Depression? If it does not necessarily represent businesses, how did it lead to, how, how did it help collapse both consumer and investment spending? And Again, this is all a bit of an oversimplification, but two very important ways. First and foremost, investment spending fell. Remember, investors, people with a lot of money, they had put their money in the stock market. So when the stock market collapsed, there were some really big investors that lost everything. There were some really important, or really rich people that lost everything. So obviously it decreased investment spending. But more important than that, it greatly reduced consumer spending even more. And the way it did that was, and this is so important to know, the reason the Great Depression is the Great Depression is because we had a complete collapse of the banking system. You cannot have a capitalist system without a, a banking system. And when the stock market collapsed, it wiped out the banking system. And there will be several bank runs. And what 
all these bank runs will ultimately lead to is a complete collapse of the banking system. And that is not an exaggeration. By 1933, when FDR comes into office, into office uh, the banking system in the United States has completely collapsed. All banks are shut down, including in New York and Texas. And so it was completely, the whole system had completely collapsed. How exactly did this, did the collapse, crash of the stock market lead to the crash of the banking system? Well, remember, banks were lending out people's life savings so other people could basically gamble on the stock market. Banks only have about 5 to 10% of people's money on hand at any time. The rest of it is lent out. So when people started hearing about banks possibly closing their doors or being hard on money, the only thing they could do is run on the banks. Remember, this is before we had the FDIC, Federal Deposits Insurance Corporation. That is a byproduct of the New Deal. We'll get to that later. This is before there's any guarantees on your deposits. So as the banking system collapsed, or as banks started, people started hearing about banks possibly losing their money, they started running on banks. How exactly does this affect people in Texas, for example? This happened in New York. Is it going to affect people all over the nation? And the answer is yes. The reason is because our banking system is all combined. Banks are lending to other banks, and they are all connected. Uh, I will give you very, one very concrete example to understand this, because right now this is a very abstract concept, but here's, one, here's a very concrete way to understand how the banking system led, or how the collapse of the stock market led to the run on banks, which the collapse of the U.S. banking system is the reason the Great Depression is the Great Depression. You don't have to know this, it's just so you understand how this all works. So there are certain cities that are really big, like Chicago, Dallas, Fort Worth, that uh, were considered banking centers because they had such large banks. One of those banking centers in Fort Worth, uh, one of the largest banks was Texas National Bank. Well, Texas National Bank of Fort Worth, February 1st, 1930, had to close its doors. So you have your money with Texas National Bank, and all of a sudden it closes its doors. You, there's nothing you can do. You can go and cry, whatever, but your money is frozen at that moment. They said, don't, we'll get back to you. Or we're going to work this out. We'll get back to you with what is going to happen. But because Fort Worth is a banking center, because Texas National Bank is such a big bank, it also was where a lot of other banks stored their money. Because of the collapse of Texas National Bank on February 1st, it led to the closing, closing of a bank in Aubrey, Texas. Aubrey, Texas at the time had a population of 439. Aubrey, the bank in Aubrey, Texas was forced to close its doors. At the time, it meant... Um, 85, uh, $8,500 was just wiped out. That was, and today that would be about $1.5 million. So it just, everyone in Aubrey and the surrounding areas, there is no recourse. They just lost all of their money. A few months later, when that bank in Fort Worth was actually able to finally get their money together, figure out how much money was lost. When it closed, it had $5.9 million in deposits. It only reimbursed a million, which is, means that about $4.9 million was completely lost. Today, that would be about $90 million. Now, that is a ton of money, obviously. Uh, even with a population of 163, let's say only people in Fort Worth were banking with them. Let's say every person in Fort Worth, which uh, all those 163 were banking with them, that is on average more than $500 per person, loss per person. And just so you know, in 2023, 
more than 60% of Americans said they cannot get $500 in an emergency. So that is a disaster. We just looked at two banks, one bank in Fort Worth that was associated with all sorts of other banks that were that collapsed because of it. And also one small bank in Auburn, Texas. This is how the collapse of the stock market in New York spread all over the nation and led to individuals who had never played the stock market, wanted nothing to do with the stock market, had been saving, lost absolutely everything. And by the time FDR comes into office in 1933, more than around 11,000 banks have closed its doors. We just looked at two. 11,000 banks in the United States had completely collapsed. That's how the stock market helped lead to the collapse of the banking system, which helped completely destroy Americans' ability, or their life savings and their ability to consume. Even if you didn't have your money in one of the banks, it affected, this affected everyone. Just also, if you lived in a city where, all your, where a bank collapsed, you knew a lot of people who lost everything. So this spread like wildfire. And if, again, if you want to know why the Great Depression is the Great Depression, it's because of the collapse of the U.S. banking system. 2007, 2008, federal government under both George W. Bush and Barack Obama bailed out the banking system. Majority of Americans today are opposed to that. The reason that happened was to avoid the Great Depression. Again, I, I can criticize banks all day. Almost every economic collapse in U.S. history have banks involved in some way, shape, or form because they do a lot of dumb stuff. But we absolutely need to have a banking system. If the banking system's collapse, that leads, it's what led to the Great Depression. That is so important to know. That is the reason the Great Depression was the Great Depression. But one major difference between the Great Depression in 2007, 2008, uh, after we bailed out the banks in 2007, 2008, the uh, bankers gave themselves huge bonuses. Pat on the back for how great of a job they did. Uh, back then, a lot of bankers actually felt responsible. A banker with the Texas National Bank of Fort Worth walked across the street, walked into the police department and uh, shot himself because he felt so bad about all the people that he let down. That is a major, major cause of the Great Depression. Or the biggest cause of the Great Depression is the financial collapse. But it is so much more complicated than just that. Again, we're not going to get into monetary policy, but one thing that you do need to know is another reason it got to be so bad was because the European economy collapsed. The reason the European economy collapsed was because of World War I and because the U.S. banking system collapsed. So in World War I, if you remember, Germany was, had to pay reparations, $33 billion to the Allied powers, especially France, uh, and also, but also England. Well, France and England, they owed money to the United States because they had borrowed a lot of money in order to wage the war. So this got to be a ridiculous, it's called the international debt cycle, and it's as stupid as it sounds. So Germany had no money. So it had to, it had no money, but it had to pay reparations to the Allies. Uh, the Allies, they had a lot of debt to the United States. Well, how was Germany supposed to pay the Allies if it didn't have any money? It borrowed billions from U.S. banks. So U.S. banks are providing loans to Germany. So Germany can pay reparations to the Allies. So the Allies can pay their war debt back to the United States. So it was an international debt cycle. And this isn't something historians look back on. They're like, what a bunch of dummies. Even at the time, people were like, this is so stupid. The French, uh, the French Secretary of the Treasury, uh, what we would call the Secretary of the Treasury, he actually asked the United States, like, why don't you just take the money from your banks and give it straight to your government since that's what's happening here anyway? So even at the time, it was criticized. And there was one way that this could be stopped. 
if the United States forgave the Allies, said, you know what, you guys were fighting for your life during World War II, that war, don't, don't worry about it, just keep it. Then the Allies said that they would forgive Germany their reparations, and Germany wouldn't have to borrow money from the United States. So the United States could have stopped this. Just so you know, after World War II, the way the U.S. handles uh, the world economy after World War II, that is case study on how you want to handle the economy after a world war. But Americans were absolutely insistent. Overwhelming majority of Americans were like, no, they have to pay us. We are not going to let them get away with not paying us. So there was no political will for this to happen. When the economy collapsed in the United States, Germany could no longer get loans from the United States. Germany's economy collapsed and stopped being able to pay the Allies. France will actually invade Germany a few times to take over some of their important industrial cities so they can pay themselves back. Uh, and that will lead to the rise of Adolf Hitler. So there was an international debt cycle because, cannot stress this point enough, this is the point you need to take away, the world economy is connected. If Europe's economy collapsed, when Europe's economy collapsed, it made the United States economy do worse because the United States couldn't sell as much. Today, in 2024, uh, China's economy is going to collapse. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but basically they are, they have put too much money into their construction industry. And it is, China's economy currently is a very, very big mess. The United States and China have about $200 billion in trade every day. If China's, economies collapse, if China's economy collapses, the U.S. economy will collapse. Europe's economy right now is also scary, but it is so important to understand that the idea that the, American, the U.S. economy is somehow an island not connected to the rest of the world is insane. The idea that we would want China's economy to do bad is completely insane. We are already interconnected. So this is, the Great Depression is a worldwide economic collapse and had its origins in World War I, but it was largely an American-made uh, economic collapse. So stock market collapse will lead, stock market collapse, banking collapse, world economy collapse will lead to a complete decline in investment and consumer spending. Now, people lost their jobs in mass. People lose their jobs, even people that don't lose their jobs, when the economy is going down, everyone becomes more frugal. It's called depression mentality. Everyone becomes more frugal, they stop buying as much. Investors stop investing. They stop building, they stop, not only to that building, they start firing people and laying people off. Obviously, being laid off means you cannot buy more, which means less consumption. So that cycle of investment and consumer spending, it is now in a downward spiral. There's less consumer spend, dramatically less consumer spending, which is leading to much less investment spending, which means companies are buying less material, which means other companies are being hurt. They're hiring less people, which means less consumer spending, which means this whole thing is in a downward spiral. So, how do we get out of it? This is a question just to keep in the back of your mind. How do you get out of this downward spiral? You need to make it go up somehow. So what do you do? What would happen if you just gave a lot of money to the really wealthy, the really rich, to the investors? Are they going to build factories and produce goods? Are they gonna start building cars? Are they gonna start building radios? Why on earth would they? What happens when you give money to consumers? They consume. They need to, to survive. They need it to pay bills, to buy food. Uh, so keep this in the back of your head for the New Deal lecture and World War II. But fundamentally, during the 1920s, just so you know, before a lot of economic collapses, it's usually preceded by what appears to be a really good, really strong economy. That is a very common occurrence. 
hey, the economy looks phenomenal, then boom, it collapses. There's always people that say, hey, there are underlying weaknesses, but when the economy is doing well, most people just do not want to hear it. Um, that is why when people say we study history to learn from our mistakes, uh, my big area of study is economic history, is economic collapses especially. It's why I'm so much fun to be around. When it comes to the economy, we never, ever, ever learn from our mistakes. So that is a very, very abbreviated and simplified version of what caused the Great Depression.